Hello, this is Baylor Healthcare Systems Healthy Hangout, a video blog that brings you up-to-date information good for you, your family, your friends. Today we're going to talk about asthma, bronchial asthma. The Center for Disease Control says there's one in 12 of us in this country who have asthma. That's almost 30 million people. And alarmingly, it seems like we're having more and more every year. We're going to talk about that, what asthma is about, what the triggers are. With me are Dr. Roger Caton, an internal medicine specialist. Dr. Sharice Wiley, also an internal medicine specialist, and Dr. Mark Millard, a lung specialist. So let's talk about asthma. Roger, what is asthma? How do you define that? Well, with all of you on the phone, usually are on this Google Hangout, we usually define asthma as two things. One is inflammation and one is bronchospasm. It's a lung disease that can occur at any time in your life, but usually seen earlier in life, but can occur in the middle ages. Um, uh, not the Middle Ages like the Roman times, but. <laughs> Dr. Wally, what, what does he mean, bronchospasm? Uh, Middle Ages, like in the 40s, 30s, and even older, and a lot of environmental triggers. Well, it, on the it, it, with bronchospasm, the best way to think about it is your muscles just basically tighten up around the airways, and as a result, that narrows down, and uh, it's like breathing through a straw. Yeah. Yeah, what do you see with this, Dr. Wiley? What do your patients complain of when they come in? What are the symptoms of bronchial asthma? Yes, some of the symptoms that they may complain about are chest tightness, cough, of course, shortness of breath, and wheezing. Those are the classic symptoms that people usually have when they have asthma. Mm -hmm. So what do we do about all this? Dr. Katon, what do we how do we treat bronchial asthma? Video problems there? Well, one of the first things is when we suspect asthma, we should get spirometry or a peak flow to demonstrate that they truly have obstructive lung disease, and then we treat it with an inhaler that's aimed at bronchodilation or an inhaler also aimed at decreasing the inflammation. Yeah, there's peak and flow. And you can get combination drugs like that. Peak flow meter, that's an important device. Dr. Millard, I don't know that everybody has a peak flow meter or knows about that. How? What is that? device and how important is it in the treatment of asthma? Well, I think what Roger had mentioned, peak flow meters and spirometry, these all essentially give us some kind of objective measurement of airflow. I mean, the sense that we have, everybody's different the way they sense. And so it's, it's important to have some kind of objective measurement. And you can get these little handheld devices. They're about, oh, maybe eight inches long. You can buy some on the internet that are electronic that may be a little bit more accurate for 35, 40 bucks. You can get some in the, in the, in the grocery store. And these give a way of objectively measuring uh, your airflow and giving you some sort of, I think, pivot point that you can say, wow, I'm really lower than normal. And once you've made the diagnosis of asthma, it's all about control, and we use a series of questions and observations to help determine how much of those medicines that Roger talked about are we using and in what order, and a peak flow is one of those uh, objective measurements. So the bronchial tubes, the airways to the lungs can dilate, they can constrict down. They do that normally, but in asthmatics they do it to an excessive degree. They constrict too much. Why do they do that? What are the triggers that can cause that to happen? Dr. Wally? Yeah. Some of the triggers are environmental factors such as pollen or dust, some of the air pollution, um, home triggers, um, pet dander cigarette smoke, um, perfumes, chemicals. There's so many things that can cause or trigger asthma. The important thing is to identify the particular trigger that the individual has so that we can lessen these triggers or altogether avoid these triggers. So you're talking about prevention. I like that. Helping to prevent yes. asthmatics from flaring up. Mm -hmm. So if we know an asthmatic is flaring up, what should they do? What do we tell them to do? Dr. Katon? One of the things I usually tell most of my patients are if they're using their rescue inhaler quite frequently during the day, and I know we're going to get to the rules of twos, is to go ahead and call us. But if they're wheezing significantly or need steroids, a lot of the asthmatics know if they need uh, oral steroids to decrease inflammation or if they need an inhaled steroid. And one of the things we ask them to do is go ahead and use a nebulizer, which is a little device that looks like a, a breathing pump and you hold it to your mouth and you breathe. The other one is to use their inhaler up to almost every four hours as long as the side effects of like tremulousness, like where they tremble, 
or their heart rate's not going too fast, I, I suggest they use that. Sometimes if they have low-grade fevers, and as we all know, asthmatics do tend to have bronchitis more frequently, then I'll even give them antibiotics earlier than most other people to prevent them from getting a worse asthmatic attack. What about colds, uh, influenza, these respiratory infections? Dr. Millard, are those also triggers for asthma? We're seeing a lot of that this fall season, in the cold season. Well, it's, it's often a sense of you have a layering effect that finally gives rise to uh, the iceberg rising up above the, the surface and symptoms developing. The underlying basis for most asthma, particularly in kiddos, is allergies. And then the viral syndrome comes in, increasing inflammation, and it's just like a trigger on a gun. I mean, boom, you have this entire cascade, inflammatory cascade, uh, shower into the airways, and as far as the patient concerned, you know, when you can't breathe, nothing else matters. So that's where your quick relief medicine is so very important. Now, the key is always prevention because if you treat the underlying cause, if you treat the underlying inflammation in the airways, you just dampen everything down, then it takes a whole lot greater stress or stimulus to trigger an asthma attack. And that's the whole idea of, of controller medicine is to prevent asthma attacks from happening by suppressing the airways inflammation, maintaining airway tone, and then, you know, you can go visit your friend who has cats and your eyes may water and your nose may run, but you won't wheeze and you won't have an asthma attack that night. So, Dr. Wiley, we have these what we call rescue treatments, rescue inhalers. We have these preventive inhalers. I think patients get these mixed up. Uh, what's the difference? When do you need a rescue and when do you need the preventer treatment? The prevention is what we recommend that our patients do daily. We, this is something that's not going to help when you're acutely short of breath. As Dr. Millard um, clearly explained, you want to decrease the inflammation in the lungs, so this is something that you want to use every single day. And these are the inhaled steroids. And then when you get in trouble, when you're acutely short of breath, when you're um, when you're wheezing, when you're coughing, that's when you want to use the rescue inhaler. And those are the beta agonists that we tell the patients to use um, either in the inhaled form or in the nebulizer form. Dr. Lord, I've got some patients that get asthma infrequently. I mean, they have it. They may get it when they exercise or get it around certain triggers, but don't have it very often. They don't require these preventive inhalers. When do you know that you need one, Dr. Millard? I think that there is a... Uh we're, we're not in undiscovered territory. The um, NHLBI, the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, for the last really almost 20 years has been developing, and there's been an evolving set of guidelines on answering exactly that question, David, which is how much or how infrequent is infrequent enough to only need your quick release medicine. And I think there's a good something we call rules of two uh, that allow us to sort of decide when you only need when you need two medicines, uh, a quick relief and a controller, or when you can just use your quick relief medicine as needed. And these are if you need your quick relief medicine or you have asthma symptoms more than two days a week, if you awaken with asthma symptoms more than two nights a month, um, if when you have an asthma attack, so you may not have often, but if when you trigger, so what is it about Lizzie? When she was good, she was very good, but when she was bad, she was horrid. I mean, that sort of thing. When you're when your asthma really is, I mean, if you only have two or three attacks a year, but they're really doozies, it clearly is, uh, is the recommendation that you be on controller therapy because you can never tell when you're going to have that attack. Those, and the final uh, sort of two is if you need prednisone by mouth uh, two or more times a year, then you probably, when you, when you do the math in terms of how much medicine gets absorbed from the inhaled corticosteroids versus just that first dose of bimouth prednisone, it's so tilted towards taking the daily low-dose inhaled steroid in terms of reducing the body's total exposure to steroids. You take it every day and you don't have that attack, you don't end up in the emergency room, you're able to exercise and you, if you've forgotten your quick relief medicine, you can go ahead and exercise and you're not worried about having an attack. Dr. Caden, I quoted the uh, Centers for Disease Control saying that asthma is increasing in this country. Have you seen this in, in your practice, and do you have any idea if this is true or why it might be true? I think, like most of you, most of us see an increase in symptoms that are related to asthma during the allergy season. So I see more of those people coming in during the spring and early fall, 
And especially, like you said just now, when we're having the cold viruses and the influenza coming in, I have more people who think they have asthma coming in. And so we usually follow them afterwards to see if they're having more symptoms. So I personally have seen an increase over the last year, about maybe 10% more population calling me about asthmatic symptoms. What do you think, uh, Dr. Wally? Is that pollution? Is that uh, more pollen yeah. or allergies? What's going on that, here? You know, that's what I think is what I, I, I wanted to point that out. I think it may be environmental with more pollution um, in our environment. I know that they're trying to, there are many governmental you know, pushes to improve our pollution, but I think that that's what's caused um, patients to actually have more asthma attacks, the pollution that we're seeing in our environment. And then, again, what uh, Dr. Katon just spoke about, sometimes people may think that they ha are having an asthma attack when it really may be just, um, you know, allergy symptoms. Mm -hmm. So we're seeing more allergies. We're seeing more mm -hmm. asthma attacks. We've got treatment with rescue inhalers. We've got preventive inhalers for the people that are chronically or have a lot of symptoms. The rules of two is a good way to figure if you need that or not. What else is new? Dr. Millard, what's on the horizon with treatment? What, do we do? what else can we do beyond these things? Current medicine we have probably controls, if you take all people with asthma, somewhere between 60 and 80 percent of folks. So we can do a pretty good job on most people. An untapped area that keeps cropping up every year is uh, the indoor environment and the impact of environmental control. For parents who have school-aged children uh, who seem to have more trouble at school, you need to kind of wander into the classroom and see whether or not it's really an allergy bin. You know, we want our schools to be warm and loving and our kids to feel comfortable, uh, but, you know, if, if the idea of a reward is for a child to go into sort of this reading nook where all these stuffed animals are and they can lay in the stuffed animals and read a book and the child happens to have dust mite allergy, you know, that's not a good idea. The indoor environment is where most of us spend time, and it's the fact that our environments are increasingly sealed, and you have uh, you, you have uh, this increased building moisture, you have more dust mites and mold. These are sorts of things that really, I think, is an untapped area for we for us to downregulate uh, the allergic exposures and the allergic triggers. Beyond that, in terms of what's on the horizon, medicine-wise, you're looking at as we, as we drill down and dive into the airways and understand the chatter between the different inflammatory cells and, and begin to be able to target some of those specific triggers and, and cytokines and chemokines, those sorts of signaling between the cells, we're finding biologicals that can, can target one patient population over another. But these are going to be several years off and they're going to be incredibly expensive. I think the, the biggest job we can do right now, the best job we can do is to educate our patients on their triggers, mm -hmm. is to have them be sure that compliance and adherence to the medication that's around is available, and to have them monitoring their asthma so they don't wake up one night in the emergency room because they forgot to took their medicine, they forgot to monitor themselves, and you know they, they, it was the worst of worlds, and, and, and they had an attack and ended up in the emergency room. You know, we still lose. 10 people a day in this country from asthma, uh, and it's a leading cause of absences from school. We can do a better job with what we have. You know, and asthma can be tricky to diagnose when they're wheezing, when they're short of breath, when they do certain things. That's one thing, but I've seen some folks with just a cough. Mm -hmm. Dr. Wadding, talk about this diagnosis. How do we diagnose asthma in these ones that are kind of bored on a little short of breath sometimes, maybe just a mild cough? What do you do to diagnose these people? Yes, I'll usually have them to come into the office and do pulmonary function tests, and that will help in the diagnosis. Um, and most of the time, if you have asthma, you're, go you're going to see a change. You're going to see an obstructive, that's what we call in medicine, an obstructive um, pattern on the pulmonary function test. And this is a test that's easily done in our offices. We all, mainly in internal medicine, we do these. Um, it's, a, it's an easy um, type of test where you blow into uh, an apparatus and then it measures the um, the the amount of, of airflow and so that gives us a good indication of whether or not um, someone has asthma um, and sometimes you know even for people whose symptoms are very mild you spoke about the cough they may only have a cough sometimes you know just sort of empirically I may have them do a trial of you know using a, a an, um, an 
an anti-inflammatory, like an inhaled steroid, or maybe you know a rescue inhaler to see if it helps their cough. But the sure way to diagnose it is with the pulmonary function test that can be done in the office. Dr. Katon, when the inhalers don't work, uh, when you need something else, maybe a shot or some pills, how do you recognize that? What do you tell patients, Dr. Katon, when to get that, when to come to the doctor? Usually, like Sharice was saying, the easy diagnosis is spirometry, but if people are getting very short-winded, they're using their rescue inhaler like four times in the evening, they're coughing, they're short of breath, I tell them, okay, we need to consider using oral steroids to help them with the inflammation. Sometimes uh, a lot of them are hesitant about steroids, so they'll use like a leukotriene inhibitor. One source is like Singulair, another one's Acrylate. And so we try to actually go for the steroids or the Singulair when I'm running out of choices with Advair. If they're on, the, say, like one of the choices of long-term is Advair, and I'm on the max dose already, and they're using their nebulizer four, six times a day, then I'm like, okay. We're at the max. We either are going to have to bring you in. And if their peak flows are low, I tell them to go to the emergency room if their peak flows are very low. If they're about 20% to 30%, I don't risk it like Dr. Millard was saying. We have a very still 10% of the population sometimes, 10 patients, I'm sorry, a day that we lose from asthma. I don't want them to not go to the ER. Dr. Millard, what's this new treatment that I've heard you're pioneering, this thermoplasty? Tell us about that. Well, bronchial thermoplasty is a uh, sort of the latest uh, treatment that is directed primarily at an area that we've, we, we've sort of focused on inflammation all this time, and bronchial thermoplasty actually is for severe asthmatics, uh, patients who really keep needing prednisone, keep her in the emergency room, and this is uh, a probe that goes into the airways, and in bronchial thermoplasty, uh, you essentially deliver a, feral, a low intensity heat, it's clearly heat, it, it damages the airway a little bit, sort of damages the smooth muscle in the airway that's constricting, and you do this in all of the medium airways of, of the lung, it takes you three sessions actually, uh, about an hour each time, patient's asleep, so you're happy, it's, it's just it takes a while, and this can reduce uh, the number of exacerbations, it can reduce, it's been shown to improve quality of life, reduce uh, reduce the, the amount of steroids you need uh, and thermoplasty is something that has uh, it's been pushed a lot by Boston Scientific that makes it and, and that you, but the evidence is now coming out we have a five-year trial that shows clearly it is safe uh, five years that shows the the group that was treated did much better uh, over time and maintain their benefits so this is an option for patients who are on prednisone who are in the emergency room who are not well controlled. It's not something for people whose asthma could be well controlled on, uh, on daily medication taken twice a day. I think right now the, the cost-benefit ratio is such that, you know, the inhalers work great and as we move from, uh, from twice a day to once a day medication, I think we're going to see more and more companies coming in with once a day medicine. We have some new medicines on the horizon by inhalation. Uh, that are used for COPD that will soon be used for asthma. I think they will help us as well. Uh, and I think the outlook is bright. So asthma, a nuisance for many, can be life-threatening for some. It can be treated. It can be prevented. Uh, standard treatment works very well for most. New treatments Dr. Millar is talking about. Uh, if you have questions out there about that, let us know. Please join us for another episode of Baylor Healthcare Systems Healthy Hangouts. Thank you, doctors. Thank you. Thank you.